It's finally time that we talk about event sourcing. In this video, I'll introduce you to the event sourcing design pattern, I'll explain what it is, and I'll show you how you can implement event sourcing if you are just getting started. So what is event sourcing? It's an architectural design pattern where we store the changes that occur in our domain as immutable events inside of an append-only log. If this seems a bit complicated, don't worry, because event sourcing is fundamentally very simple, but let's try to break it down into its individual components so that we can understand it better. At the core of event sourcing, we have events. And events are immutable facts that occur in our domain, and the critical distinction here is that events should carry business intent. So here are a few example events from the bank account domain that also carry business intent. For example, we have an account created event, money deposited, a transfer was sent, the account limit was updated, a fee was charged from your account. So all of these are immutable facts of something happening to a bank account and all of these events happen in some sort of sequence. So this is our next concept after events. We have streams. Streams represent a stream of events, an append-only log of events for a given identifier. Now, how do we uniquely identify a stream? Typically, this is going to represent your domain entity or aggregate, and you will be storing the events that occur in this aggregate in a single stream. So if we go back to our bank account example, this is what our event stream would look like. We would first have an account created event, then we could have any number of deposited or withdrawn events, maybe sending some transfers. If we take a line of credit, then we also have to be charged some interest. And finally, the lifetime of this stream completes when we encounter the account closed event. So event sourcing is about describing the changes that occur in your domain as immutable facts called events. These events carry business intent and of course they will carry the required data to describe a given event. So each of these events will have a unique account identifier and then some specific data that are relevant to a particular event. But notice that at no point are we storing the complete state of a bank account. We are just storing the individual changes that occur on the overall aggregate. So this brings us to our next concept in event sourcing, which is about state. How do we actually determine what is the state of our aggregate so that we can decide if we are allowed to perform another operation or not? And this is one of the most important concepts to understand with event sourcing. We are never really storing the application state. We are only storing the events that represent the changes in state. Now, in order to perform our business logic, we will need to calculate the application state at the current point in time. And how we do this is we simply take the stream of events that we have in some sort of database, which is often called an event store, and we replay the events one by one, starting from a blank slate, the empty state of our bank account, and we apply these events one by one. So we would first have the account created event and calculate the current state of our bank account based on this event. Then we're going to apply the money deposited event, the money withdrawn event, and each of these events contains some metadata telling us what happened to our aggregate. And then based on that, we can determine what is the current state of the account. Once we have replayed all of the events, we get the most up-to-date state of our aggregate. So I'm going to stop here when it comes to our theoretical discussion about event sourcing and then let's jump into the code where I'm going to show you how you can implement an event sourcing aggregate. I won't be using a database or an event store, we're just going to model our events and a bank account and I'll show you how to design an aggregate that's using the event sourcing pattern. So let's start by defining a base class that's going to represent our event. And one of the core properties that I want on an event is the stream ID, so that I can identify the aggregate where this event belongs to. Now, I'm also going to include a date time property, which is going to be my timestamp, and I'm going to initialize it by default to the current UTC time. So this is going to be our base event type. Now, let's talk about specific events that are relevant for our bank account domain. So I'm going to create a record called account opened. And what I want to do here is to be able to identify this account somehow. So I'm going to create an account ID. Then let's also store the account holder name as part of this event. And then we're going to have an initial deposit 
which could be zero, but this is the amount that you will deposit into the account when you are opening it. And of course, let's specify a currency and I'm going to have a default value. Now we're going to inherit from the base event and what I'm going to do is to pass the account ID property as the stream identifier to the base event class. Now let's go ahead and create a couple of more events. For example, we could have a money deposited event and we have to know which account it is. So I'm also going to add an account ID. Then let's have an amount and I'm going to add a string property representing the description of this deposit. And then let's also inherit from the base event and I will pass the account ID as the stream identifier. Let's also copy this and instead of money deposited, I'm going to make a money withdrawn event, which also contains the same properties, but the name of the event carries a different business intent. In the first case, we are depositing into an account. In the latter case, we are withdrawing a given amount from our bank account. Let me create another event, which I will call money transferred. And it's also going to contain an account ID, an amount. I will need another identifier that's going to represent which account I am transferring the amount to, and then all else remains the same. And finally, let's create another event that's going to complete the lifetime of our aggregate. And I'm going to call this the account closed event. It's also going to need an account identifier. And let's also specify a reason why we are closing the account. So now we have a couple of events inside of our domain that represent what can happen to a bank account. We can open it, deposit money to it, withdraw or transfer money to a different bank account. And finally, when we no longer need the bank services, we can close the bank account. And instead of storing this as just one state object in a relational database, what we do is we store a stream of events that explains what happened to our aggregate, our bank account during its lifetime. And you will see that this opens up a lot of possibilities to what you can do with an event stream. Now, what do we need next? We need our bank account entity. So let's define our domain entity or aggregate. So I'm going to create a public class called bank account. And then inside of it, I'm going to specify some initial state. We need a way to identify our bank account. So we'll have an identifier. Then we have our account holder, the current balance, the currency of this bank account, and if it is active or not. One more thing that I'm going to add is a list of events. Let's call this events. It's only going to have a get accessor and I'm going to initialize it to an empty list. Now, ideally, this would be an immutable list, but for our example, I'm just going to use a simple in-memory collection, and we're going to store the events that we apply on our aggregate inside of this list. Now, let's actually talk about behavior and initializing our aggregate. So I'm going to start by creating a private constructor. It's going to be a parameterless constructor, and this will prevent anyone from instantiating a bank account. So now, if I were to attempt to create a bank account by saying new bank account, you will see that I'm not able to because the default constructor is private. So we need to expose a different way to create a bank account. So what options do we have? We can create a factory method to instantiate a new bank account and let's call it open. It's going to contain the account holder and it's going to also contain the initial deposit. So let's specify the initial deposit and let's also specify the currency and let's leave the default value as in our event. We can do some precondition checks. For example, if the account holder's name is null or white space, we can throw a new argument exception and let's say that the account holder name is required. So we're writing this as we would in a typical domain aggregate. Now let's check the initial deposit and if it's less than zero, I'm going to throw another argument exception and we're going to say the initial deposit can't be negative. And finally, we get to our bank account. So let's create a new bank account instance. And because we are within the context of our bank account type, we have access to the private constructor. So we're going to initialize it and return it as a result of this method. Now, what about setting the state of our bank account? Well, we won't actually do this. We're going to initialize an account opened event. 
And here we can specify a new identifier for the bank account. And we already have the account holder, the initial deposit and the currency. So we have our event. Now, what do we do? Well, now we need a way to apply this event to our aggregate. So I'm going to call some apply method, which doesn't exist yet, and apply this event to modify the bank account's state. So this is the only way how we modify the state. We apply our events, which represent immutable facts of something happening in the domain. In this case, we are opening an account. So let's create a private method called apply, which is going to accept an object representing our event. And then I can do a switch on the event. And based on the event type, I can do some different behavior. So let's say when I encounter an account opened event, I'm going to set the identifier, the account holder name, the balance, the currency, if the event is active or not, and then we can break. So I'm going to accept this autocomplete and I'm going to omit appending the event because I want to move this outside of the switch statement. And I'm also going to update the argument to be the event base type. So this is how we actually modify the state. We apply events that modify the bank account. And at this point, we can also introduce cases for the other events. So when we encounter the money deposited event, we want to increase the balance of the bank account by the amount value. When we encounter the money withdrawn event, we want to decrease the balance based on the event's amount. What about the money transferred event? Well, we also want to decrease the balance. So this is the same as a withdrawal, except the business intent is different. And then we have the account closed event. And in this case, I want to set that the account is no longer active and we're going to complete our switch statement. So now we are handling all of our business events inside of the apply method. And now all that's left to do is to expose behavior on our aggregate is going to actually apply these events if the required preconditions are satisfied. What else can we do now that we have the apply method? Well, now we have an option to fetch the stream of events from our event store and replay them to get the current state of our aggregate. So let's have a method returning a bank account and this will actually be a static method and let's call it replay events. The argument is an array of events and what do we do inside? So we will initialize a new bank account instance and then we can iterate over the collection of events and apply them one by one. Now it's assumed that the collection of events is stored based on their timestamp. This is something that an event store will guarantee. And once we replay all of the events, we get the latest state of the bank account aggregate. And now all that's left to do is to implement the behavior methods. So we need a way to withdraw money, to transfer money, to deposit money, and to close an account. Now I'm going to speed up this part and add a few helper methods. So the first one is going to be a helper method to ensure that the account is active. So I'm just going to apply a precondition check, and if the account is closed or not active, we're going to throw an invalid operation exception. So now let's implement our behavior. So after opening the account, we want to be able to deposit money into the account. So we expose a method called deposit, where we specify the amount and the description. We're going to ensure that the account is active, that the amount is non-negative, and then we can apply the money deposited event. We specify the identifier that we have on the current instance, and this is how we change our state, but we also record the fact that the money deposited event occurred. In the same fashion, I can implement the withdraw method with its preconditions, and then apply the money withdrawn event. And then let me do the same for the transfer and close methods. I'll create a transfer to method where you can specify the account ID, where you are transferring a given amount and a description. It has its own preconditions, and then we apply the money transfer event. And when we are closing the account, we have to ensure that it's active to begin with. Then we have to ensure that the balance is equal to zero because we can't close an account that hasn't been emptied. So this is basically our business logic that we are checking before applying the event. So finally, we have the account closed event. It's going to transfer the account into the inactive state and we complete the lifetime of a bank account. So now that we have our event source aggregate, how do we actually use it? That's what I want to show you next. So remember that we can't use the constructor, but we can use the static open method. In here, I'm going to specify the account holder name 
and let's say that the initial deposit amount is 1000. So now we have our bank account instance and we can invoke the other methods on our bank account. So let's say I deposit $500 and this is my salary deposit. Then I can go ahead and withdraw, for example, 200 and this is going to be an ATM withdrawal. Then I can go ahead and transfer some money into a different account, withdraw the current account balance, which I can take from the bank account state. And finally, I'm going to close the bank account and let's give some reason. So now I'm going to add some right line statements to print the final balance and all of the events. And to make this more interesting, I'm going to store the events that we have on our bank account, replay them to obtain the same bank account, and then I'm going to attempt to deposit $100 and we'll see what happens. So let's go ahead and start the sample and observe what's going to happen. So we first open our bank account. This contains a couple of preconditions. Then we initialize an empty bank account and we create an account open event. We apply this event, which leads us to this switch statement, where we modify the bank account state, and we append the event to the events collection. Finally, we return the updated instance. Then we're going to deposit some money, withdraw some money, transfer some money, withdraw again, and we're going to close the account. So the account is still active, and this precondition is going to complete. We empty the account balance, so our business check, if the balance is non-zero, is going to pass, and we're going to apply the account closed event. So let me jump into the apply method. Let's go over the switch statement, and if I take a look at the events collection, you will see that it contains the six events that we have applied so far. Each of them have the same stream ID and their respective timestamps in order of creation, and this completes the lifetime of our bank account. So our stream has received a final event, and based on our business logic, it can't receive another one. So I'm going to jump over the statements here, where we print out some stuff to the console. We'll get back to that. And then let's try to take the events that we have and replay them. So what do we do? We initialize the bank account and I'm going to replay the events one by one as they occur. So this would be like me fetching the events from an event store and replaying them to obtain the final state of my aggregate. So if I go ahead and compare the bank account instance that we see here, you will see that it has six events. The balance is zero, the account holder is MJ, and if I take a look at the bank account that we originally had, you will see that it has the same state. So this is how you derive the current state of the aggregate by replaying the events. Now, what happens if I try to deposit an amount after replaying the events? Well, my precondition is going to fail because the account is closed and I'm going to write the exception into the console. And if we take a look at the console, we can see how we were applying the events. So we first have the account opened event, then the deposited event, withdrawn, transferred, withdrawn again, and the account has been closed. And then we will try to replay these events and withdraw again. And this time we ran into an exception because the account was already closed and we don't allow any changes on closed bank accounts. Now having to rerun your events every time you want to calculate the current state is pretty expensive. And the bigger the system you have is, the more expensive this is going to become. And that's why we introduced the concept of projections. So projections allow us to create the read model for the aggregates that we have inside of our domain. So as the events are being appended to the event stream, we are going to store them in an event store, but we're also going to process them inside of our projections. And these projections can produce the read models that are optimized for reading. We can store the read models as JSON documents that we can easily return to the client based on the stream identifier. So for example, we have an event stream for our bank accounts and we can apply a set of projections on these events to produce some specialized read models, like a balance tracker, so that we can easily display the current state. We can have a read model for our transaction list or recent activity, for analytics and some summaries, and you can derive all of the state from scratch based on the event stream, which you have as an immutable fact inside of your event store. And remember that the event store is an append-only lock. We can only add events to the stream and we can never delete them. I hope you enjoyed this introduction to the event sourcing design pattern and found it valuable. Let me know in the comments if I should make more videos about event sourcing. One topic that we could explore is introducing an actual event store and then creating some projections for our read models. If you want to improve your skills further, then you should watch this video next. 
check out my software architecture courses to become a better .NET developer and until next time stay awesome.